Uh, I'm Tom Yukas. Uh, we're here in Ohio, Illinois, northern Illinois, about an hour south of Rockford. Um, farmer all my life, uh, switched over to organic farming uh, seven years ago, transitioned uh, for a couple purposes. One, to uh, economics, is poor time in farming, needed something to get a little more boost. And I'd been going to an organic farming conference and got a little bit of the bug. And slowly over a few years, you know, decided it was the right thing to do besides the economical thing to do. And uh, it's been a learning process since then and getting, getting along pretty good, I think. Uh, this is a cover crop uh, following winter wheat, uh, harvested in June, end of June. And this was seeded like the 15th of August. Uh, what was it? 10 pounds of hairy vetch and about 7 to 8 pounds of uh, tillage radish. I've tried this for, this will be the third year on it. And it works out pretty good. The only concern I had was one year I deep ripped before planting. Uh, and the tillage radish was a dry year and really went down those uh, deep rip marks. And I had some shallow tiles. And the next spring, here the tiles had gotten filled up with the white hair roots of the tillage radish, and it was a headache. So uh, I warn anybody doing that, if you have shallow tiles, don't do it. So, uh, but it's a good scavenger, I guess, is one of the terms used for tillage radish. I just broke those off. Um, but they get down, loosen up the ground a little bit, and they'll die after... Um, they say three nights of 20 degrees or less, which we've had maybe one or two in the 20s, not 20 degrees or less, but in the 20s. And uh, they're starting to die off a little bit, you can see on the edges of the leaves. But the rest is growing pretty strong yet. These new ones are growing. What are the soil benefits of this cover crop? Uh, the tillage radish, like I said, loosens the ground and slowly, after it dies in the winter and the spring, will slowly release those nutrients that have scavenged it up, which uh, helps for the soil tills plus the nutrient level. If you had leftover nutrients, you know, from the previous crop of the wheat, you know, it's not going to go wasted. It's going to be sucked into some green matter. And uh, there's hairy vetch underneath, which hairy vetch is a legume that's putting back in the nitrogen, uh, which will be worked in, you know, before planting. You need to wait till about the middle of May. Uh, to get the maximum benefit from the hairy vetch. The tillage radish will be uh, all gone by then. This is some of the hairy vetch. It's a little bit crowded out by the uh, tillage radish this year. It's usually a little higher than that. But you also need a little bit of a winter cover for the hairy vetch. Um, it's a little susceptible to frost damage and actually being killed off. So if you got a good lush cover of the till tillage radish, it'll help protect the hairy vetch underneath. Uh, it'll add all my nitrogen that I'll need for my corn crop. This will be planted into corn. Uh, we did side dress it with uh, a ton of compost for the acre, and that's why I think we got a good lush growth on the tillage radish this year. Uh, it's worked out well for me. One concern I've had in the past, uh, in the spring, the hairy vetch is so lush that the mulch, the cutworm moth blights just love it. And they'll lay eggs and then you get the cutworms, you know, in the spring. Had one year I had to replant maybe 40 acres of corn from cutworm damage. But one year out of four, so one year out of three, that isn't too bad. Um, you'll catch it once in a while. I've since tried an earlier variety of hairy vetch, but it doesn't winter uh, as good. So that's not an option up here in northern Illinois anyway. The other option is to wait until you plant corn a little later, uh, like two weeks after you first disrupt the uh, disc up the ground. So I do that a little bit. You're pushing the limit on planting days for corn then. You're planting the late May instead of mid-May. But uh, sometimes you got to try it. And that's been working good enough. I had some real good yields on corn this year following it. So. On the sandy ground, it really helps hold the ground through the winter too. As you can see, this isn't going to blow away or, you know, have any erosion on it. So it helps it out.
Are the uh, time and energy inputs into planting this uh, cover crop and tilling it in, tilling it under, outweighed by uh, a less need of for uh, soil amendments? Yes, uh, by growing the cover crops, like I said, I'm providing all my nitrogen credits, which you know would be you know, easily 150 to 200 dollars an acre, you know, in nitrogen alone. If I had to get my nitrogen out of compost for the price of compost, compost is 80 to 100 bucks a ton. You'd need a couple ton of compost at least, you know, to provide that much nitrogen. So that's a good savings. The cost of the cover crop itself, roughly $30 for the hairy vetch and maybe 10 or 15 for the tillage radish. Per acre. Per acre yeah. cost, yep. And uh, the actual planting isn't that much. I use a no-till drill. And so the cost benefits are very good. Uh, and that's the system for organics. If you weren't organics, the, the benefits wouldn't be near, wouldn't be as much because your crop inputs could be less, bought for less. But there's still guys using this system, you know, conventionally and uh, getting a good boost. You know. And what organic crops do you, do you plant here and the cost benefits of them? Uh, out here we plant uh, corn, organic corn, organic soybeans, bolster feed. I haven't done any food grade on those yet. We plant organic wheat and organic oats and sometimes organic rye. Um, the cost benefits of organics this year have been good. Last year were pretty good. Generally speaking, it's usually double the price of conventional crops, but that varies with the year of the organic, of course. Uh, right now we're looking at 12 to 12 and a half dollars a bushel for corn, organic corn. Right now, cash corn conventional is 580 to six. So that's roughly in that range. Soybeans right now are 19 to 20 dollars a bushel organic. Uh, conventional beans are right around 11 or 12, you know. So that's in the range. Oats, there's not a big premium. Organic oats are five, five and a half. Uh, regular oats would be three, three and a half. And on the wheat, organic wheat was uh, nine, nine and a half this year. And you could have got seven, seven and a half for conventional wheat. So the cost benefits are there. You're giving up some yield, you know, in the transition. Uh, I'm catching up on my yield though. After five years, my yields on conventional corn and beans are pretty close to approaching what I had before. Uh, before I was in a no-till system and uh, my yields out here were in the 150 to 165 bushel range on corn and 40 to 45 bushel range on beans. Starting out on organics, the first years was pretty slim. It was 100 bushel. Uh, beans were still good. They were 35, 40. But after getting the learning curve in and learning more about levels of compost to put on, the amounts of compost put on, getting more of a nutrient adding cover crop as hairy vetch. All those things have helped me a lot. Of course the weather varies each year, but uh, uh, my yields now in organic corn this year, I did some test plots. My best was 189 bushel corn, which would approach some of my best in conventional. Uh, I never had field averages there yet. Uh, fielded average this year on all my farms we're in that 130, 140 bushel range for organic corn. Uh, for organic beans, uh, this year 45 to 50, you know, caught it. Last year was a little better than that even. So organic beans, you know, I've really come up for yields. Didn't have much of a yield lag there. Uh, in fact, that was approaching some of my best yields probably before. So um, oats uh, varieties and the weather really affects oats. I had 90 bushel oats, which for me was great, organic oats, I, and uh, never raised oats before for conventional, but you know, that's pretty much what conventional does around here. Wheat, I uh, don't get good yields out of wheat, I can't understand what's happening there yet, so uh, my wheat yields 45 to 50, uh, good wheat yields before that were 65, you know, 68. I've had some 68 and I even had some 80 bushel wheat in test strips, but field averages aren't quite there. So a little bit of a lag there, but 
that's the beauty of having a rotation. You know, in rotations, you can, one year you might make it good on the one crop, uh, the next year, you know, it might be a different crop. So you need those rotations to break up the pest cycle, to break up, you know, the weed pressures, and uh, it just makes for a better system. Um, so the economics will come out in the end, you know. It looks good, corn looks good now, I'll just plant all my acres to corn, but you know, I wouldn't be able to get this cover crop in, you know, after we, I'd have higher crop inputs, I'd be losing some of the benefits, you know, that this cover crop does. So, um, you have to look at it long range, you know, and that's a change, you know, when conventional farming, if the price was good on corn, you planted all corn. If the price is good on beans, you could shift a little bit more into beans. But you're a little more locked in on that system when you have a rotation in organics. You need to keep the system, they call it, going. You know, I can't just jump in and out with one crop to a mono crop. I've got, you know, that rotation in place. Um, rotations help the work level big time. You know, before when I didn't have wheat, it was quite a crunch, you know, to get things in in the fall, to get things dry, to try to get, you know, some rye in after soybeans and stuff. Now with, you know, a third or a fourth of my crop in, have the crunch period you don't have the drier uh, stress you know for drying the crop the bottlenecks I have my own bins and you can separate bins out it just works and is so much less pressure you know having this variety of crops 